welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll be using principal axes to derive equations for the physics of rotating bodies. These equations are collectively known as Euler's equations. We'll start out with our 3D rigid body here. It's rotating at angular velocity omega through an axis that's anchored at the center of mass. It's also translating at velocity v. This body has principal axes omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3, where I11 is the smallest moment of inertia and I33 is the largest. Previously, we decomposed the angular momentum of this body into a translational component about the center of mass and another further rotation of the body. These are the orbital and spin components of the angular momentum. However, if the axis of rotation doesn't stay fixed, either with respect to the lab frame coordinates or the body coordinates, calculations in the lab frame become challenging, so using the body frame is easier. In this frame, the angular momentum is just I11 omega 1, I22 omega 2, and I33 omega 3. Likewise, the angular momentum for the center of mass can be expressed in the new basis. However, the new basis isn't an inertial coordinate system, so we'll need to deal with that when we work out what the torques on the system are. Torque is just the rate of change of the angular momentum of the body, which is given by dLCM by dt plus dL body by dt. The second term here is the same as it would be in a regular coordinate system, since the center of mass lies at the origin of these principal axes. However, the first term here is taking a derivative in the rotating coordinate system. We did that before though, and we showed that in a rotating coordinate frame, du by dt is equal to omega cross u. Since we're in the body frame, the vector we're taking the derivative of is the angular momentum of the body. The center of mass angular momentum is a bit like a Coriolis force. So the rate of change of the orbital angular momentum is equal to omega cross the angular momentum of the body. When we expand this term wise, we get three different equations. We get that the torque in the omega one hat direction is equal to I11 times omega one dot, so that comes from this term here, minus I22 minus I33 times omega two times omega three. And that bit comes from this term here. Likewise, for the other two components, the torque in the omega 2 hat direction is I22 times omega 2 dot minus I33 minus I11 times omega 1 times omega 3. And the torque in the omega 3 hat direction is given by I33 times omega 3 dot minus I11 minus I22 times omega 1 times omega 2. These are collectively known as Euler's equations. We'll start by looking at a rigid body that's rotating about one of its principal axes. Let's say omega 1 at time 0 is equal to omega 1 naught and omega 2 at time 0 is equal to omega 3 at time 0 is equal to 0. So the other two angular frequencies are initially 0. When there is no external torque on the system, we have a torque-free version of the Euler equations, which relate the rate of change of each of the angular momenta components to the other angular momenta components. The torque-free version of the Euler equation for the first principal axis says that I11 times omega 1 dot is equal to I22 minus I33 times omega 2 times omega 3. But in this case, these last two terms are zero since omega 2 and omega 3 are initially zero. So omega 1 dot equals zero and nothing changes from the initial state. However, it's impossible to align any rotation strictly along one of the principal axis directions. So we can't construct a system where any of the three omegas are strictly zero. That means that the angular momentum vector will change over time. Imagine we start a rotation as close as possible to the principal axis direction corresponding with the largest moment of inertia. So in our convention, that's omega three right here. Our initial conditions are given by omega 3 at time equals 0 is equal to omega 3 naught, and omega 1 naught and omega 2 naught are much, much less than omega 3 naught. Then the torque free Euler equations are given by I11 times omega 1 dot equals I22 minus I33 times omega 3 times omega 2. I22 times omega 2 dot is equal to I33 minus I11 times omega 3 times omega 1. 
And lastly, I33 times omega3 dot is equal to I11 minus I22 times omega1 times omega2. Let's look at what these mean. Since omega-1 and omega-2 are small, that means their product is vanishingly small. That tells us that this third term here is approximately equal to zero, which means that omega-3 is approximately a constant. If omega-3 is constant, we know that I11 minus I33 times omega-3 is a constant, and likewise I33 minus I11 times omega-3 is a constant. Now we have a simple set of coupled equations for omega-1 dot and omega-2 dot. To solve these, let's just take the derivative of the first equation and plug it into the second equation. This gives us a second order equation for omega-1, which says that I11 times omega-1 double dot is equal to some constant k times omega-1. Since I33 is the largest moment of inertia, this term here is positive, and this term here is negative, which means that our overall k is negative, which means that this is the standard harmonic equation. So the behavior of the system is that omega-3 doesn't change. We have a small rotation that takes us from omega-1 to omega-2 and back and forth in the transverse direction. What happens now if I were to start a rotation as close as possible to omega-1? This is the smallest moment. Omega-1 naught is much greater than either omega-2 naught or omega-3 naught. This term here, omega-3 times omega-2, is vanishingly small, and omega-1 is approximately a constant. Like we said before, these terms here depend only on omega-1, which means that these are constants. And we can do just like we did before and take the derivative of our second equation and plug it into the first equation to end up with a second order differential equation, only this time now it's for omega-2. So again, we want to figure out what the sign of k is. We know that I33 is the largest moment and I11 is the smallest moment which tells us that this term here is positive and this term here is negative. So again, the overall k is less than zero, and this gives us again a harmonic equation. So primarily we're rotating about an axis that points along the omega-1 hat direction, but it's wobbling back and forth between omega-2 and omega-3. Therefore, rotations about omega-1 hat and omega-3 hat are stable because this constant k is always less than zero. However, if we look at rotations that are as close as possible to omega-2, which is the direction about the intermediate moment of inertia, then omega-2 naught is much, much greater than omega-1 naught or omega-3 naught. And we'll play the same game again. This tells us that this term is approximately equal to zero, so omega-2 is approximately a constant then these two terms, again, are approximately constants. So we can differentiate this equation with respect to time and plug it into the definition for omega-1 dot. And we get the same equation yet again. Only this time, notice that I33 is greater than I22, and I22 is greater than I11. So both of these terms are negative. That means that our overall k is positive, which means that this is no longer the equation for simple harmonic motion. The modes now in these directions grow exponentially, which tells us that rotations about omega2 are unstable because this constant here, k, is greater than zero. What we just arrived is called the intermediate axis theorem. This says that rotations about the intermediate moment of inertia are intrinsically unstable. In space, this is often called the Zabinikov effect. What you're going to see is an astronaut starting this T-shaped object here rotating about its intermediate axis, which is this one. The smallest moment is passing through this axis, and the largest moment is about an axis that passes vertically through the T. He's going to start spinning it along the intermediate axis, which is aligned along here. What you'll see is that this motion becomes unstable and the whole body starts flipping back and forth radically about its center of mass. Imagine now we have a body with two equal moments. Let's say that I11 is equal to I22. Then the torque-free Euler equation for omega-3 says that I33 times omega-3 dot is equal to I11 minus I22 times omega-1 times omega-2. But this term is obviously equal to zero. 
which says omega-3 must be a constant. The torque-free Euler equations for the other two moments say that omega-1 dot is equal to I22 minus I33 times omega-3 divided by I11 times omega-2. And omega-2 dot is equal to minus the same constant times omega-1. Let's call this constant here capital omega. Therefore, omega-1 dot is equal to big omega times omega-2, and omega-2 dot is equal to minus big omega times omega-1. We can solve this the way we just did before, or we can use a different trick. Here, let's define eta as omega-1 plus i omega-2. Then eta dot is going to be equal to minus i times big omega times eta. When we solve this, we get eta is equal to eta naught times e to the minus i times big omega times t. This tells us that our total angular velocity as a function of time is now going to be omega naught times cosine big omega t in the omega 1 direction minus omega naught times sine big omega t in the omega 2 direction and omega 3 naught in the omega 3 direction. So what does this look like? Here's an example of an object that has two equal moments of inertia. And here we're going to be looking at the body frame. This is our omega 3 direction. And in the body frame, omega-3 is constant. So this direction is not going to change at all. A total angular velocity vector here makes angle alpha with respect to the omega-3 direction. And it's going to rotate about omega-3 at rate big omega. Likewise, if we have an angular momentum vector, here this is going to make angle beta with the total angular velocity. This is also going to rotate around omega-3 at rate big omega. What happens now if we want to look at the same object but in the lab frame? Again, this is the omega-3 direction. In the lab frame, torque is equal to zero, which tells us that we've got constant angular momentum. So this vector is always going to be constant. This means that both the total angular velocity omega and the omega-3 vector have to rotate around the angular momentum vector at some rate omega prime. And omega prime is given by the magnitude of the angular momentum divided by I11. There are several types of problems that we use Euler's equations to solve. Two types of problems that we frequently see are, imagine that we have an object that gets struck impulsively. What is the motion immediately afterwards? The other type of problem we see a lot is an object rotates around a fixed axis. A torque is applied. What is the frequency of the subsequent motion? Or vice versa. For the first problem, the steps we want to follow are first, solve for the angular momentum from the impulse r cross the angular impulse is equal to the change in angular momentum. Then we're going to calculate the principal moments of inertia. From there, we solve the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular velocity vector for the angular velocity vector. And we use that to solve for the velocities we're interested in relative to the center of mass. Lastly, we add on any velocity that the center of mass originally had. For the other type of problem, the first thing we want to do is calculate the principal moments and the principal axes. Then using these, we'll solve the equation the angular momentum is equal to the moment of inertia tensor times the angular velocity vector for the angular velocity vector. Then we solve torque is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum and use whatever physics there are in the problem to find the applied torque. And lastly, we set step three equal to step four and solve for the angular velocity omega. In the next video, we'll learn how to express 3D rotational motion of a rigid body in terms of Euler angles and quaternions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.